Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm so pleased to be with you this morning, even though it's virtual and pre-taped a couple of weeks ahead of time, but it, it's really good to be here. I'm also pleased that I get to kind of virtually interact with the, the folks that I worked with last year on the National Leadership Academy for the Public's Health out of Iowa. Uh, Angie Tagtow, Jill Lang, Aaron Berquist, and Lindy Buckingham shoot. They've been, they were wonderful partners that we worked on over the course of last year on policy system environmental change strategies about nutrition in Iowa. But it's also really an honor to be part of the, the Harkin Symposium because Senator Harkin has always been one of my, my heroes because of his, his work in, uh, with disabilities and uh, uh, public health, uh, you know, reproductive health. And I was so disappointed when he uh, stepped down <clears throat> from the Senate because he was the, the leader in, in public health. And when he did that, I went to my Senator at the time, Al Franken and said, Al, you need to step into the shoes of, of Senator Harkin. He says, I can't do that because his shoes are too big. Uh, so he, he has a lot of stature here in Minnesota. So it's really an honor to be part of the, the team here today. Now, I know you're talking about food and food is medicine and its impact, and you're gonna have a lot of people talking about that in particular detail. I'm gonna give you more of the context in which food fits and particularly the context of equity. And so we know that health is the center of everything, but also food can really be the thought about in the same way that food is an essential element or essential medicine in creating some of the conditions that are on this picture. Um, and and all, but also that the social and environmental conditions also help food uh, as create community, create health for individuals and communities. So we're going to take that in that that context. Now, you know, I'm I'm just uh, one state north of you, and we have a lot in common, Minnesota and Iowa. As I'm sitting in my living room with the snow in the, on the outside. Uh, you know, we share a border, we share a river, which I think is a good metaphor uh, for what, how we're connected in so many ways and how what we do in one state influences things in another state. Um, also, we're very common in that we are healthy states. Uh, we both are in the, the you know, the top 20% or the top 20 of health for state health rankings. Um, Minnesota is a little bit ahead of Iowa, but uh, you're catching up. Uh, but I also I, I always highlight the fact that I don't want Minnesota to be the healthiest state in the union. I want every state to be the healthiest state in the union. So we really need to work collectively so that all states turn that light color. The other thing is we're also uh, part of the Big Ten. You know, Minnesota and I are part of the Big Ten. And I know uh, that uh, Senator Harkin went to Iowa State and that this is coming out of Drake University. So we have to pull into those, those post -sec other post-secondary education uh, groups. And I'm gonna be coming back to this map a little bit later, but uh, you know, it's nice to have all of those academic institutions. Another thing that, that we're you know, common about Minnesota and Iowa that we really have good health systems, both at the state level, which is the map on the upper left which shows that Minnesota and Iowa are really in the top quartile in terms of overall state health performance uh, in national rankings. And on the right side is local health, health systems. So we have good state and local health systems. Uh, and then the most recent rankings actually in 2020, <clears throat> you can see that Minnesota is number three and Iowa is now number four. Uh, and you're catching up because Minnesota has dropped down one and, and Iowa has gone up two. Uh, so we're really similar in so many ways in terms of environment and people and, and health. Uh, and, and since I'm a pediatrician most of all, and, and I've worked in maternal and child health, so I'll be having lots of uh, references to the maternal and child health activities. So infant mortality has been something I've been working on my entire career. And you can see that Minnesota and Iowa are both doing quite well overall in terms of infant mortality. Again, really in the the top echelon of states in the United States. And in the area of food insecurity, you know, we don't have any areas that are, are really food insecure in terms of uh, you know, relative to many of the other parts of the country, particularly the South. So access to food is fairly good, not, not as good as it should be, but uh, <clears throat> among the best in the country. But certainly there are other areas where, <clears throat> excuse me, where we're not doing quite as well. And obesity is one of those. Minnesota is doing a little bit better, but it's nothing to brag about because we're still, you know, over 25% of the people are, are obese. 
Um, and we have lots of other company, unfortunately, throughout the country. So I know that, that Lake Wobegon is probably right on the border <clears throat> of Minnesota and Iowa. And so I often uh, paraphrase uh, Garrison Keeler uh, from Lake Wobegon, who says, Minnesota and Iowa, where the women are strong, the men are good looking, and almost all of our health statistics are above average. Unless you're a person of color or an American Indian or GLBTQIA or have a disability. And I think that is one of the things that we really have to pay attention to. That's one of the things I'll be talking about today. Now this map shows on the left, the infant mortality rate for whites. And you can see Minnesota and Iowa, we've already exceeded the healthy people 2030 goal for infant mortality, which is five. Uh, we got better than that a long time ago. So we're, we're doing quite well. However, if you look on the, the map on the right, which is the infant mortality for uh, children of black women, you can see that um, you know, Iowa is, is not doing well you know, relative to whites, uh, but doing better than most other states, certainly doing better than Minnesota. But I do point out the fact that this map, and this goes back to the big 10 states, if you'll notice on this, that the big 10 states have the highest overall African-American infant mortality rate in the country. And I bring this up for a couple of reasons that the issues that we're dealing with, they may be state specific, but they're really regional and national. And I also bring it up because I think academic institutions need to get involved. And I, you know, I've been trying to push the big 10 universities to take on social issues as part of their uh, their portfolio and they be held accountable for those issues. <clears throat> now I do want to point out and I do some comparisons. I have lots of comparisons in the Big Ten states, but I'm only going to do a couple here. And one is related to Iowa because you say, well, we have a good, you know, black uh, infant mortality rate relative to the rest of the, the Big Ten states. Well, the reason, but, but you still have disparities because your white infant mortality rate is so good. You still have about in a black infant mortality that's two and a half times that of whites. And it's those disparities that actually cause the biggest difference, not the actual number oftentimes, it's the disparity. And you can see that, that Minnesota, uh, our rate has gone up from the previous one because half of our black births are to African born women as opposed to US born blacks. And if you, the African born women are much healthier in terms of their birth outcomes, if you take them out, the African American rate infant mortality rate goes up dramatically in Minnesota. So we have three times the rate for black Afri US born African black women uh, compared to whites. And on the other end of the spectrum, longevity, life expectancy is, is one of those, you know, infant mortality, life expectancy um, are the two of the, the standards. This is life expectancy after the age of 65. Once you reach 65, how many years do you live? And you can see the states, Iowa is underlined in red. Um, and you can see Minnesota is right in the middle. Actually in Minnesota, African-Americans and whites live about the same amount of time. But the difference is if you look at the, the whites are in the blue and African-Americans are in the green or brown, the dark part is healthy life expectancy after 65. The lighter color is unhealthy life expectancy after 65. And there's huge disparities. And in fact, Iowa has the largest difference in healthy life expectancy or unhealthy life expectancy after 65 in the country, followed by Nebraska and Minnesota. And this is not just in the Big Ten, this is nationally. So you know, when people age, in, in Iowa, they get to be 65. They really only have about six years of healthy life expectancy after that compared to uh, almost 15 years of healthy life expectancy for the white population. And one of the gaps that we really have is in overall poverty. And again, you can see Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Iowa are the worst in the nation in terms of the white black gap in terms of poverty. And again, if you look at the big 10 states, we're again among the highest in the country. And so this is a concern for all of us uh, as we work for health equity, looking at both the outcomes and the conditions that lead to those health outcomes. 
Now I mentioned that I, I really work on mostly maternal and child health kinds of things. So I moved to Minnesota in 1980, which is at the beginning of this slide. After all my medical training, I'm board certified in medicine and pediatrics, and I got a master's in public health from the University of North Carolina, you know, very well trained. Um, so I came to Minnesota in 1980 to run the maternal and child health program for the city of Minneapolis. And the infant mortality rate and disparities was one of the things I really wanted to work at. So I took all of the good medical care that I had learned and put those into practice, took all of the good public health activities that I had learned in public health school and put them into practice. I got people, in, people enrolled in Medicaid. I got people enrolled in WIC. I got people enrolled in food stamps, uh, really extended home visiting, really worked on perinatal, regional perinatal care. And for 15 years worked on trying to reduce the infant mortality rate in Minneapolis and reduce the disparities. Now these numbers that I'm showing here are national numbers, but th things in Minnesota and, was, and Minneapolis are exactly the same as these. And so for 15 years, I did that. The best medical care possible, the best public health care possible. And then I left and ran the health service at the University of Minnesota for 16 years, and then came back into governmental public health in 2011 when I was chosen to be health commissioner for Governor Mark Dayton. That's the end of this slide here. 2011 is when I came back. And I decided to look back over those 31 years that I had been in Minnesota and say, what happened with the infant mortality rate during that time? And I was shocked to discover that after 31 years of all of the work that we did, the black infant mortality rate in Minnesota had still in, 20, in 2011 had still not reached the white infant mortality rate in 1980, 31 years, and we had not closed that gap. And since that time, it hasn't gotten any better. And so that really, and, and, and I discovered that it's not just in infant mortality, it's in almost every other area. This is uh, related to education, reading scores, again, in, in fourth, eighth, and 12th grade reading levels, the, the rates of whites, or of, of African Americans or Hispanics in 20, 2008 have still not reached the level of whites in 1975. So that what we are doing is not working. The best care that we provide is not working. So this really harkens back to the definition of public health that I really work on is that the landmarks of political, economic and social history are the moments when some condition passed from the category of the given into the category of the intolerable. I believe that the history of public health might well be written as a record of successive redefinings of the unacceptable. It's a given that African-American and American Indian babies are gonna die at two to three times that of whites. It's a given that black moms are going to die at three times the rate of whites. It's a given that African-American <clears throat> males are gonna be incarcerated at 10 times the rate of their white counterparts. Why is that a given? It should be intolerable, should be unacceptable. The other is that our systems are not working. Our medical care system, our uh, public health system, our education system, our transportation system, our housing system are also not working. And that should be unacceptable. So the role of public health is to define those as unacceptable and then work to change those. <clears throat> so I'm talking about equity, but why should, why should we be concerned about equity? Well, I can be really crass in that it's a math problem. You know, we, you can see on this slide that the, over the, the next uh, 30 years, uh, whites are not going to be a majority in this country. They're gonna go down to about 47% of the population and, and populations of color will increase. So we will have no majority population. So if we don't reduce the disparities and we become increasingly diverse, our average is gonna go down. So it's a math problem but actually it's a social justice problem. And, and I don't, and I don't think most people wanna live in a society where people don't get their basic needs met, uh, where people don't have the opportunity to thrive and some people benefit at the expense of other people, which is my definition of, of social justice, that everybody gets their basic needs met, they have the opportunity to thrive and nobody benefits at the expense of others. It is a social justice problem. It's a kind of world that I want for myself, for my kids, my grandkids and hopefully someday my great grandkids. And social justice is the core of what public health is all about. 
Bill Fagey, the Center for Disease Prevention and Control director back in the, the 80s said, the philosophy behind science is to discover truth. The philosophy behind medicine is to use that truth for the benefit of your patient. And the philosophy behind public health is social justice. Social justice is what public health is all about. And that's what we should be working for. The other reason we should <clears throat> be concerned about equity is that we have a vested interest in the outcomes. You know, as, as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And I'll show you how that plays out. So on the left is the infant mortality rate going from the upper left to the lower right. The uh, red bar is the black infant mortality rate. The blue bar is all race infant mortality and the uh, sort of green bar is the white infant mortality. And it should be going you know, from upper left to lower right, which is happening. But the other bar that is going from the lower left to the upper right is the disparity in black white differences in infant mortality. And you can see that during World War II in the 1940s, disparities went down. The black white disparity went down because we had a common purpose. We were all together with a common purpose. We were working collectively. We also had universal access to maternity care <clears throat> for all servicemen and women um, so that, and, their, and their children. So it had universal access to care and disparities went down. When the war ended, that program went away. We, had, we lost our, our, our collective effort. Disparities increased. Then they dropped again in the 60s when the war on poverty really brought us all together. And, and, we, and we had a health and all policies approach, which I'll show you later, and it reduced the, the disparities. Since that time, however, the disparities have been growing up dramatically. And then the, the chart on the right is actually the infant mortality rate of the United States in dark blue compared to the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, which really are the other wealthy countries in the world. And you can see right at the time around the late 70s and 80s, we started to fall behind our international comparisons. We fell farther and behind in terms of infant mortality rate. When our disparities started to increase, we started to fall behind. It was affecting our overall infant mortality rate. So in 1960, we had the 12th best infant mortality rate in the world. In 2015, it was 38th, and it's been getting worse every year. Disparities are impacting our overall health. On the other end of the spectrum is life expectancy. On the left, you see the life expectancy by race, and the green bar is African-American life expectancy. And you can see that there was a, a real plateauing of improvement in life expectancy during the 80s and through the first part of the 90s. It was also at that time on the right where we started to see our comparisons, both male and female to our OECD counterparts, we started to fall behind. Again, when disparities increased, that's when we started to lose stature internationally. We started to lose our place in the top echelon of healthy countries. And I don't have a similar uh, chart for maternal deaths, but this is one that just shows the US rate of maternal mortality rate going up. We're one of three countries in the world that's going up in terms of maternal mortality. And again, it's because of our huge disparities. Most of the deaths are among African-American women. US, the Caucasian deaths, 11 deaths per 100,000 live births, almost 35 deaths per 100,000 live births. This is an issue I thought that we had solved back in the 60s and the 70s when I was in medical school because the rates had gone so low. They are now going up and continue to rise. And then the last reason why we should be concerned with equity is because I believe along with nuclear war, climate change, pandemics, which we're experiencing, one of which we're experiencing right now, and inequities, these are the existential challenges to our society. If we don't deal with these, they will change our societies forever may destroy them or basically change them so they're, that they're not uh, recognizable. And also you'll see as we, I go through sort of what, how we need to address these, how we address inequities are exactly the same way that we need to address climate change, pandemic and nuclear war. And so inequities I believe are an existential challenge. And we're seeing this playing out 
throughout our country right now. Since the death of George Floyd and the racial injustice protests, you can see that it's showing what Frederick Douglass mentioned many years ago is true, where justice is denied, where poverty is enforced, where ignorance prevails, and where any one class is made to feel that society is an organized conspiracy to oppress, rob, and degrade them, neither persons nor property will be safe. Inequities are an existential challenge to our society like we know it. Now, <clears throat> There's one other uh, commonality we have, and that's Norman Borlaug. And you probably know more about Norman Borlaug than I do since he's from Iowa and did most of his work there. But I mean, he has a, a really tremendous uh, CV in terms of the things that he's done and the awards that he's received. <clears throat> and he's been one of my heroes. I've uh, you know grown up uh, really recognizing his work, particularly with saving over a billion people from starvation. But you're well aware that that he has been criticized recently. The Green Revolution has been criticized for some of the outcomes that it has produced. And I really think it's really interesting because another one of my heroes, poet Wendell Berry, who's a farmer in Kentucky and who often has come to Iowa to speak, uh, has sort of had a critique of the Green Revolution. He said, a bad solution solves for a single purpose or goal, such as increased production. And it's typical of such solutions that they achieve stupendous increase in production at exorbitant biological and social costs. Good solutions recognize that they are part of a larger whole. They solve for more than one problem and don't create new problems. A good solution should not enrich one person by the distress or impoverishment of another. It's basically a social justice perspective. And so that's often been used, to, that sort of rhetoric has been used to criticize uh, the, the work that uh, Dr. Borlaug had. But, Really, if you look at what Dr. Borlaug has, has said, he says, I have worked with the production of more and better wheat for feeding hungry people, but wheat is merely a catalyst, a part of the picture. I am interested in the total development of human beings. Only by attacking the whole problem can we raise the standard of living for all people in all communities <clears throat> so that they will be able to live decent lives. This is something we want for all people on the planet. So Dr. Borlaug understood the need for a more comprehensive approach. We, but he also understood the need for each of us to do what we can. So I don't see the criticisms about the Green Revolution really are something that Dr. Borlaug had to concern about. It's something that we need to be concerned about because we have not done our part. We as a society have not done all of the other work that needs to go along with uh, feeding the hungry and, and creating uh, increased food supply. It is a comprehensive effort. So the, the, the blame for the problems should come to the rest of society um, and we need to move forward. So, so, so why haven't we as a society focused on attacking the whole problem and the total development of human beings as Dr. Borlaug had said we should? Well, it's because of our dominant worldview, the, the traditional worldview that we have in our country, which forms the basis for most of our policies, our social, uh, structures, our public policies. It relates from the fact of that bootstrap individualism. You know, if you just worked hard, you'll be able to succeed. Also, the fact that, you know, we, we need free markets. Competition is good. And then education is for job training. And that structural discrimination, we, we, we resolved that in the 60s with the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. That's done. A reliance on technology. You know, we, if something happens, we'll be able to fix it with technology. But there's also a mistrust of science, which you can see play out in sort of the vaccine hesitancy that we have and the denial of, of climate change data. And then small government. We are, you know, you've heard it in many elections. You know, the government is the problem, not the solution. And the less government, the better. And if government actually went away, uh, it would be, you know, be a good idea. That's the framework that really leads to a disinvestment, a decreased investment in the commons, something the common good, and leads to investment in the disadvantage because if they just worked hard they would succeed so we don't want to give them anything because it'll keep them from working hard it increases competition and polarization and it leads to a health narrative that really is not healthy that health is an individual responsibility that competition and consumer choice and health care is really what drives it that health care should be run like a business 
that anyone can choose to be healthy. It's not about discrimination. It's just a matter of choice that medical care will cure me if I get sick. And I know what's best for my family. Don't tell me what I should do. And I don't, don't tell me about wearing masks or social distancing and health is a private matter. Got to keep government out of my health. Also that, then that leads to blaming individuals and it leads to an overinvestment in the biomedical model. And this slide is a really good demonstration of that overinvestment in the biomedical model. On the along the X axis is the amount of money we spend per person per year on healthcare. On the Y axis is life expectancy. The sort of gray lines are all those OECD countries, the other industrialized countries. <clears throat> and the red line is the United States. And you can see that we matched other countries up until about 1980. Our rate of both improvement in life expectancy and our expenses in, for healthcare were about the same. But it changed in 1980 when we started to overinvest in medical care. And it seems like the more we invest each year along the line, that we're now up to over 13, this, is, this was 2014, up to now we're over 13,000 per person per year on healthcare. And the more money we spend on healthcare, the farther we fall behind. It's almost like spending money on healthcare is bad for our health. But it's not that we spend overall more on health, it's we spend more on health care. This slide shows that if you look at total health and human services spending, the United States is you know, fairly far down on the list in terms of total dollars. The problem is we spend much more than anybody else on medical care and less on public health and social services. In fact, in the OECD countries, for every dollar spent on health care, they spend two on public health and social services. In the US, for every dollar we spend on healthcare, only about 55 cents is spent on public health and social services. And those are the services that actually make a difference in population health. So we need to change how we do our work, which struck me back when you know, I was looking at infant mortality in Minnesota. And public health has a way to do that. Public health is what we as a society do collectively to assure the conditions in which all people can be healthy. So it's not a matter of doctors and nurses or public health agencies. It's what we as a society collectively. So I know there are lots of people on this, this Zoom that are not in the health care field necessarily. You're a public health person if you want to improve the conditions in which people live and work, go to school and pray so that they can be healthy. So we know it's those conditions that actually impact health. You know, I'm sitting in my living room in a nice house, in a safe neighborhood, close to uh, restaurants and, and grocery stores that have lots of good food. I have, I hope, good internet connectivity. And when I call the police, if ever I need to, they show up and they treat me with respect. It's easy, relatively easy for me to make healthy choices. It's easier for me to be healthy than people who live in low opportunity communities that are also in my, in my city, where they have lots of rental housing, poor housing conditions, poor schools, uh, fast food restaurants, no access to, to uh, healthy food, transportation options are, are low, have poor IT connectivity. It's hard for people in those low opportunity communities to make healthy choices because they're not available to them. They, you always say the healthy choice should be the easy choice, but first a healthy choice has to be a possible choice. And you can see why in many places where you live, you have a high rate of obesity and diabetes, and asthma and cancer. And so when I was state health commissioner, we put this together because this graphic together, because we were spending a lot of time on the diseases, what we call diseases of disconnection and despair. Most people are calling them diseases of despair, but it's the disconnection piece that I think leads to the despair. We were spending a lot of time on, you know, substance abuse and addiction and obesity and anxiety and homicides and suicides <clears throat> and cirrhosis. That's sort of the end result. We've also forced put a lot of effort into adverse childhood experiences, what's happening in families in terms of divorce and separation and mental illness and incarceration and drug abuse. But really, those are just treating the symptoms. It's really the adverse societal conditions of ineffective schools, income inequality, poverty, unemployment, food insecurity, environmental contamination, historical trauma, all of those factors are really the conditions that lead to adverse childhood experiences that then lead to diseases of disconnection and despair. 
If we're going to be successful in making a healthy community and a healthy society, we need to get to the root of the problem. And these are just some of those adverse societal th things that result from those adverse societal conditions. Lack of a high school graduation kills about 240,000 people per year. Racial segregation, low social support, individual level poverty, income inequality. This is more deaths per year than COVID-19. These social conditions are actually an epidemic in our society that are an existential threat to our existence. So we know that, that health is impacted by living conditions. We know that the data are showing that overpoweringly over the last several years. So we need to change that. So we need the capacity, we need the power to change the living conditions to impact health, but we don't know how to do that. It's not taught to us in medical school or nursing school <clears throat> or even public health school. So we decided that we needed a theory of change. How can we really strengthen our capacity to act? How can we build the power to actually make changes in living conditions that can improve health? And so we said, we need, to, we need to organize. We need community organizing strategies. We need to organize the narrative. We need to change the narrative about what creates health and then use that to build the public will for the right kind of investment. We need to organize the resources. So we take the resources and so they're structured and, and, and invested in the right way. And we need to organize the people to directly impact decision makers and hold decision makers accountable and have their voice at the table. So we need to organize the narrative, the resources and the people. And we put this together in, in what we call the triple aim of health equity. Expand our understanding of what creates health, organize the narrative, implement a health and all policies approach with health equity as a goal, organize the resources and strengthen the capacity of the community to create its own healthy future. That's organize the people all around the whole notion of social cohesion and social justice, which should be at the core of all of this. And so let's look at, at those briefly. Expand our understanding of what creates health. On the left is what the data are showing in terms of what actually determines health. Most people think that clinical care has a huge role to play. Now I'm a physician and I don't undersell what medical care can do. It's really important and we need a good medical care system and a lot of work needs to happen, but it really only contributes between 10 and 20%, depending on the, the research that has been done. Physical environment, about the same. Health behaviors, about 30%, the choices that we make and the socioeconomic factors that actually play a difference. Those socioeconomic factors are oftentimes called the social determinants of health or vital conditions for health are those things that were listed by WHO on the right side. These are the conditions in which people are born, live, work, and play. <clears throat> However, you know, just looking back at that, that 30%, I, I challenge that 30% in terms of health behaviors, because if you look at where people live, if people are living in low opportunity communities, if they live in a place where there's adverse social conditions that impact their childhood experiences, and recognizing the fact that we market tobacco and alcohol and soda and fast foods like crazy. It's oftentimes it overwhelms the individual. Like I say, making a healthy choice an easy choice. No, sometimes people don't even have a possible choice. So it's almost like this cartoon, which is the real reason dinosaurs became extinct. It would be like, yeah, we've got to blame smoking as the reason dinosaurs went extinct indicate, you know, forget about all of the climate change and the disasters that happened ecologically at that point in time. We blame individuals. And so I believe, I don't have any data to prove this. This is just my opinion that really about our determinants of health, about 60% are really the social determinants of health. Health behaviors, clinical care, environment, biology are all about 10% each. And it's those social factors that are shaped by the distribution of money, power, social policies, politics that are beyond the control of the individual. That's why they're social determinants. They can't, they're not in, they're not impacted directly by individuals, but they affect all individuals and they disproportionately affect people of color and American Indians. And because of that, I think we have to acknowledge that structural racism is at the core of many of those policies that, that disadvantage people of color and American Indians. And I have to admit, you know, so I often say, why is an old white guy talking about uh, health equity and structural racism, because I'm in the society that I want to be better. And also the fact that because I'm an old, privileged, uh, heterosexual male physician, 
I can say some things and they have some power. And having, when I said as state health commissioner that structural racism was at the core of the problems that we were having in Minnesota related to the disparities, it had an impact. It actually opened up the conversation in ways that probably would not have happened if it had been an African-American male. I mean, so we all have a role to play and we have to take advantage of that. And so when we're expanding the narrative, we all have a role to play in expanding that narrative because we have a voice that's important to be heard. And so expanding that narrative, public sentiment is everything as Lincoln said, with public sentiment, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. So narrative is really important and we really, have to put forth an alternative. The, the, the worldview on the left is what I went through before. The worldview on the right is the worldview that we're gonna need if we're going to address climate change, if we're going to address pandemics, if we're going to address nuclear threats, if we're going to address inequities, that, that we're living in an independent world. Social cohesion is important. They're about social responsibility and social justice. That education is for enlightenment. Equity is the challenge of the present. There's a need for generalists. We need collaboration and cooperation. And there's necessary government, which then would lead to a health narrative that health is a collective responsibility. <clears throat> health is a right and a community good. Well-being is the goal, not economic success of our healthcare system. Health equity is a challenge for the present. And we need to pay attention to historical trauma. We need to balance our investment in public health and medical care. We need a health and all policies approach and we need government to protect the public good through policy system and environmental change strategies. That's investment in community resilience and equity. The second piece of the triple aim is, you know, organize the resources, a health and all policies and health and all sectors approach with health equity as the goal. They have to have health equity as a goal because things like transportation if it's not done right, it actually leads to gentrification of neighborhoods, which in, enhances it. Similarly with paid leave, if only fully employed individuals get paid leave and the part-time workers don't, it actually enhances disparities. And so these are the things that, that, that I worked on when I was health commissioner in Minnesota in terms of things that were, were really important for advancing public health. Worked with all of the other commissioners and all the other agencies. And I told Mark Dayton, the Governor Dayton, I said, the biggest public health achievement you had as governor was to increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour in Minnesota. Because if you move somebody from the lowest quintile of income to the second lowest quintile of income, you increase their life expectancy by about three and a half years. Similarly, if you give 10 weeks of paid maternity leave, you decrease infant mortality by about 10%. And we're the only country in the world that doesn't have universal paid maternity leave. Uh, and so all of these other areas, all there's policies in each one of those that really have an impact on overall health. And thinking of policies, we just got over a, a really a momentous election, but I look back to the biggest, what I think is the biggest public health achievement of the 20th century was when women got the right to vote in 1920. And on the left is the maternal mortality rate and you can see that it dropped dramatically when women got the right to vote because policymakers had to pay attention to the needs of women. Infant mortality on the right had been going down but continued to drop dramatically when women got the right to vote. It actually changed public health because women advocated for the Shepherd Towner Act. For those of you who want to look at history, we look at Shepherd Towner Act, changed public health dramatically. And then in the 60s, you know, the, the two little chart in the middle, which is the, the black white difference in infant mortality, the disparities that's going up since the 70s. <clears throat> you can see it went down in the 60s because of things like the war on poverty, which was a health and all policies approach with health equity as the goal. I think it's remarkable. Can you imagine today's Congress getting this kind of legislation through in, in one congressional session, in one Congress? Title V is Social Security, Head Start, Medicare, Medicaid, school lunch, urban development, voting rights, vehicle pollution, humanity. I mean, it was a health and all policies approach, had a huge impact. Hex actually had such a great impact that the reaction of people who did not like the building of power in local communities have fought to overturn it and has been under attack since that time. And just one brief thing, this is the obesity rates with Minnesota and its surrounding states 
uh, Iowa, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wisconsin. And you can see Minnesota's at the bottom because we started a policy system and environmental change strategy earlier than most of the other states and had re-decreased our obesity rates. It's been challenged recently with le less funding for the efforts for our statewide health improvement program. And so we're starting to lose ground, but it points out to the fact that policies make a difference in some of these outcomes. So then the third piece is organize the people, strengthen the capacity of communities to create their own healthy future. <clears throat> and you can see here, this is generally how we think about things. People are affected with something, they, they, you know, and we don't wanna keep them from dying, they're sick, or they, they have, they're, they're healthy, but they, they have some risk factors or they're vulnerable. And this is where we focus a lot of our efforts. We focus our specialty care on people who are dying, primary care on you know, people who uh, maybe have some risk factor, but it hasn't shown itself yet on traditional public health primary prevention. And we spend most of our money on the right side of this and less money as we go to the left. And that's where we do a lot of disease management, a lot of screening, lots of drugs, <clears throat> a lot of health education. The problem is the vulnerable population is increasing and overwhelming our system. So we have to move farther upstream to really have safe and healthier populations. This is where we really need to do our work. This is where public health needs to work. This is where we need to, to focus most of our efforts. We need to transform deprivation and dependency and violence and environmental care. We need to strengthen democracy. That's why voting is so important, increasing access to voting. Strengthening democracy is what's happening here. Working on increasing food security and food sovereignty, mutual accountability so that the population is at the, people are, voices are at the table and again, public policy makers are held accountable. That, that we have multiple voices. This is where we need to work. And I love the quotation from Wendell Berry. The community is the smallest unit of health. To speak of the health of an isolated individual is a contradiction in terms. Health is not about individuals. Health is about relationships. Health is in community. Health is in relationships. <clears throat> and lastly, at the middle of that triple aim of health equity is the whole idea of social cohesion, social justice and belonging. <clears throat> Mother Teresa said the greatest epidemic today is not TB or HIV or leprosy, it's being unwanted. Being unwanted, unloved, uncared for, forgotten by everyone is a much greater hunger, a much greater poverty than the person who has nothing to eat. And Wendell Berry says a proper community is a commonwealth. It answers the needs practical as well as social and spiritual of its members. Among them, the need to need one another. Health is in belonging. And the data are pointing this out more dramatically every day. If you're in relationship, if you have a healthy relationship with other individuals and family, neighborhood, community, you're gonna be healthy. So if you ask all of the right questions, you can actually advance health equity in each of these areas, asking questions about our understanding about the values underlying decisions, what's assumed to be true, what's the, what's the, 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 the worldview that we're dealing with? What are the health and equity implications of every policy that we have? What are the partnerships? Who's at the decision-making table? Who's not, who sets the table? Who has the power at the table? And are we building strengthening relationships? Is it inclusive? Do people feel like they belong? Are we building social capital? So what would, health, what would it look like if equity was the starting point for decision-making? Our work would be different. Our work would be to expand our understanding of what creates health, change the narrative, implement a health in all policies with health equity as a goal, organize the resources so that it goes to the right things, strengthen capacity of community, build community power to make change our work would be different. So I'm thinking about that in terms of our work would be different and we need to do it differently. And I'm an English major from way back. And it struck me when, when Amanda Gorman had her poem at the inauguration, it made a huge difference. And it made me think back to William Carlos Williams, a physician, a primary care doc in New Jersey. He said, it's difficult to get the news from poems yet men die every day for lack of what is found there. We need to start incorporating some of the non-biologic science. We need to look at arts and poetry and music and dance as a form of creating health because it's difficult to get news from poems, yet men die every day for lack of what is found there. And I hearken back to this poem, which was 70 years ago this month, 
that Langston Hughes published this poem, Dream Deferred. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? This poem inspired Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. with his I Have a Dream speech. This poem actually helped create movement in the social justice movement, in the civil rights movement. So poetry, art, can also work with science and biology. So given that, I'm gonna take a little risk here and pull out my guitar because I think we also need a soundtrack for social justice because we have a movement going on. We need to build a movement for social justice and public health. We can't defer our dreams or be deterred by others. Students. Keep your eyes on the prize, hold on. <clears throat> We must embrace our dream with health, equity as a theme. Keep your eyes on the prize, hold on. Hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize, hold on. We help everyone to cope when we nurture seeds of hope. Keep your eyes on the prize, hold on. The seeds we plant today promise all a better day. Keep your eyes on the prize, hold on, hold on, hold on, keep your eyes on the prize, hold on. Everyone can be healthy when we have food sovereignty, keep your eyes on the prize, hold on. That's why we're here today to help find a better way, keep your eyes on the prize, hold on. Hold on, hold on, keep your eyes on the prize, hold on. We must all take a stand when there's an equity in our land. Keep your eyes on the prize, hold on. Social justice is our goal for the community as a whole. Keep your eyes on the prize, hold on. Hold on, hold on. Prize, hold on. So that we had that what happens to a dream deferred and dreams are really important. As William Butler Yeats said, in dreams begins responsibility. You know, we, once we have a dream, if we can dream it, we have some responsibility to make it move forward. And if we dream about social justice, it's responsibility for us to make it happen. So I look at this South African song this is something that we really need to pay attention to and work toward. Bambalela, bambalela, oh bambalela, bambalela, bamba, 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 oh bamba, bambalela. It means never give up, never give up, oh never give up, never give up, never, 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 oh never, never give up. Nurture your dreams, nurture your dreams, oh, nurture your dreams, nurture your dreams. Always, 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 always nurture your dreams. We all belong, we all belong, oh, we all belong, we all belong. Always, 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 always know we belong. Bambalela, bambalela, oh, bambalela. Bambalela, bamba, 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 oh, bamba, bamba, lela. And I'll leave with this last quote from Gwendolyn Brooks, the first African American to receive a Pulitzer Prize. She said, Live not for the battles won, live not for the end of the song, live in the along. Our effort is never done. The constant redefinition of the unacceptable is what we need. Live in the along, live in the along, oh, live in the along. Live in the along, always, 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 always live in the along. Bambalela, bambalela, oh, bambalela, never give up. Never, 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 oh, never, never give up. Thank you all, and I look forward to our conversation live. Peace.